Thank you, Hampton. You know, we've promised you at the end of the show today something a little bit less depressing than everything that has come before it. Something that points a way towards a future that maybe we can not only survive in and uh, pay off our mortgages, but actually be proud of. The big lie of the economic crisis is that it began in 2007. To understand where we need to go from here, you actually need to go long before that. It didn't begin in 07. At the very least, it began earlier than that, early in the aughts, when the credit bubble inflated and the bust became inevitable. But some economists believe it began even earlier than that. They say it began in the 70s. It began when we stopped innovating as much. Now, advanced economies don't tend to grow because they discover new land or people or resources. They grow because they discover new ideas. This is a piece of the puzzle that's the hardest to talk about because it is the fuzziest, the most indistinct. It's easy to talk about credit or demand or the dollar. It's easy to talk about innovations that have already happened, like antibiotics, automobiles, and the internet. But it's hard to talk about the ideas that no one has thought of yet. But oddly enough, it's actually something we can measure. And the way we measure their contribution to the economy is by subtraction. Economists call this total factor productivity, or TFP. And it refers to the growth left over after you subtract the growth in things like factories, population, and education. It's the remainder. It's the part that humans thought of rather than the part that they found. And it has been slowing down. According to a new report by the Hamilton Foundation, before 1973, TFP increased on average by 1.9% per year. Since 1973, it's been 0.7%. It sounds dry, 0.7s, 1.9s, but here's what it means for your paycheck. If we had stayed on the trend we were on between the 1940s and the 1970s, hourly compensation would be $18 higher today, or 51% more than it is. Now, many economists think that slowdown has been behind the relentless buildup in credit over the last few decades. That's where the connection between TFP and the financial crisis comes in. Americans were used to seeing their living standards rise. When they stopped rising the way they had in previous years, we turned to credit to fill the gap. Now we're paying for it. But if we're looking for a sustainable recovery, one that leads to a durable prosperity and, frankly, better lives, we have to get that innovation machine back on track. Join me now is MIT economist Michael Greenstone, director of the Hamilton Project and one of the authors of the report. Michael, thank you for being here. Thanks, Ezra. The first question, I guess, is the obvious one. What happened? Did we get dumber? Where did our innovation go? You know, innovation, as you were saying, is a tricky thing. Uh, there's not a magic formula, but rather it, it kind of comes out of an ecosystem or a series of small choices that all add up to something big. Uh, and I think what happened is that beginning uh, sometime in the 1970s, we stopped being as aggressive in making those investments and kind of putting together the lattice work uh, that leads to innovation and ultimately determines our living standards. So you talk about that lattice work. I think the stereotype of innovation is that it is a lone genius in his attic, the Sergey Brin and Larry Page in a garage inventing Google. And that implies there's sort of no role for society, much less the government. We just sort of wait there and hope these guys think they're great thoughts. Is that the way it goes or am I missing something? No, actually, you know, the Google example is really perfect. Uh, so if you just trace out the history of Google, uh, Sergey Brin emigrated to the United States with his parents uh, when he was six years old. So that's a part of that reflect our immigration policy. He then uh, went to schools in America. He went uh, to an excellent public university, University of Maryland, did very well there. Uh, then was awarded a National Science Foundation fellowship that allowed him to go to Stanford. Uh, at Stanford, he met uh, he, he met Larry Page. Together, they came up with this idea for Google, and you know, then they, they found themselves in this area where there was lots of high-tech workers. Their ideas could be protected because we have good uh, protection of intellectual property, and there was you know very fertile capital markets. And so, all of those things are small, it, it, taken at a piece. You take the National Science Foundation Fellowship, you take that he went to a public university. But when you put it all together, it created the conditions that allowed his brilliant idea to turn into Google. And now Google has you know 20,000 employees, I think 13,000 employees in the United States alone.
Now, what worries me when I hear uh, an example like that is that you look at what we're cutting right now. Obviously, we're in a period in which deficit reduction is a top issue. But what people really, what politicians really like to reduce isn't the deficit. They love cutting discretionary spending. And discretionary spending, people don't tend to know what's in it, but that's where R&D is. That's where education is. That's where infrastructure investment is. And more than that, on the state level, where they are cutting back substantially, they're slashing education. I mean, the University of California, where I went, is a jewel of a university system. But it is being absolutely chopped apart right now as California attempts to get its budget in order. So are we being penny wise and pound foolish here in the way that we're trying to balance our budget? You know, I, I think it's a lot like if you think about a typical American family. Uh, you know, in, we're in a tough economic situation. And if you think about a, tough, a typical American family, they're thinking, well, I have to pay my mortgage. I got to pay the utility bill. And the key thing that the, uh, a forward-looking American family is going to do is in, they will continue to pay mortgage. They'll continue to pay the utility bill. They might eat out a little bit less. But they're not going to stop putting money into the fund for their, college, uh, their child's education. They're not going to stop putting money into 401ks. And that's, that analogy applies to the federal budget. Uh, they're, they're, we have to continue to invest in the future in the way that you know, our parents did for us. Michael Greenstone, thank you very much. Thank you. And we